Anyway, okay, well, thanks for coming. Uh, I brought a little weather with me, too. Yeah. You like the thunder last night? No. Oh, yes. Yes. Loved it. Uh, I loved it. My dog It was a lot worse down at my house in Foxwoods. Um, yeah, a tornado here last year. We did. Oh, yeah. I was yes. the one that did the survey for it. So I'm, I'm the one that actually declared it a tornado. So my name is Glenn Field. I work at the National Weather Service in uh, Norton, Massachusetts. We used to be in Taunton. We moved to Norton last year, a brand new building just for, built just for us. Um, and so uh, the National Weather Service is part of your federal government, your tax dollars paid for this presentation. <laughs> um, we're part of NOAA. Everybody know what, let's see, does this work? Hey. Oh, there we go. Ah, Noah. Okay. Noah's in, is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Although we have a lot of uh, acronym, you know, a lot of acronyms. The National Organization for the Advancement of Acronyms. That's one of them. Or no organization at all. That's another good one. But. Um, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, that's good. It's going to be, if you don't get used to my humor, it's going to be a long morning. <laughs> that wasn't a joke. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so they asked me to talk for three hours about the severe thunder. Yes. Uh, oh, severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. Um, that's my favorite um, presentation, although hurricanes is another good one. Um, if we have time, we could maybe run through that, but it depends how, how interested you are. But um, <clears throat> anyway, so um, so let's move on. Severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. Some of the jokes are corny, so you have to be uh, prepared to be annoyed. Okay? <laughs> so <clears throat> this is Massachusetts, right? It's not, it's not Kansas, you know? It's not... Um, the Midwest. We don't get tornadoes here. Of course, I already told you we did get a minor one there last year. Um, so a lot of people say we never get it here. That's kind of like what we like to call the five stages of weather denial. And okay, the first stage is that never happens here, right? Did, didn't happen in Windsor Locks, Connecticut in 1979. Didn't destroy the Bradley Air Museum or anything. Um, in October of all things. <clears throat> Stage two is, okay, it happens, but it won't happen to me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, a tornado didn't rip through downtown Providence, Rhode Island and destroy the YMCA in 1986 or anything. Wow. Um, okay, stage three is, well, maybe it could happen to me, but it won't be too bad. No, certainly won't be a moving experience or anything like it was in Worcester in 1953. <clears throat> Fine, maybe it will happen, maybe it'll be bad, but I'm not going to be able to do anything about it. So, I'm not going to waste my time trying to get prepared. And besides, tornadoes can't strike big cities or anything, can they? Like. New York City, for example, during the Tall Ships Parade in the Bicentennial of 1976. There's the Statue of Liberty and there's a tornado right on the, on the ground in 1976. Here's uh, the Mormon Tabernacle in Salt Lake City of uh, Utah. I don't want to say Ohio. <laughs> Utah. Salt Lake City, Utah in 1999. <clears throat> And uh, there's a tornado in downtown Miami. It's actually a water spout that moved inland into downtown Miami. And of course, two weeks after 9-11, a tornado went right through. There's the Washington Monument right through College Park, Maryland. Um, and they were still cleaning up the Pentagon from 9-11. And uh, tornado strikes, that's all they need, right? So I guess that's not true. Then you hear a roaring sound. 
Helen Hunt goes flying by, <laughs> people that saw Twister, right? Or Bill Paxton for the women in the audience. <laughs> then you realize you don't realize the first thing about what to do. That's when you reach the fifth stage of weather denial, which is <laughs> holy moly. <laughs> right? Holy mackerel on Cape Cod. In, in Ohio, they say holy Toledo. Uh, We'll leave it at that. Okay, so, so now here's a, a slightly outdated chart. It's only through 2017, but you get the idea. Um, these are the number of reported tornadoes in our southern New England area. And um, so you can see that Worcester County had 38 tornadoes in 68 years. So that's about one every two years, one and a half to two years. But it's a bigger county than all the others. So if you divide it in half, the numbers sort of match the others here, 19, 20. Um, more like one every three years uh, in this area. So there's a little bit of a tornado alley in southern New England, not like the Midwest tornado alley, Kansas, Oklahoma. but but. Um, from Litchfield County in Northwest Connecticut, all the way up into Western Mass, Central Mass, and even into Hillsborough County, New Hampshire. Um, there's a lot more tornadoes than you get down in this area. Uh, only one in Southern Rhode Island here, um, eight, nine, 11. So generally, on average, about one every eight years down here, and one every three years out in the West. And the reason is out here you get a lot more of the, the cooling temperatures from the ocean and things kind of fall apart. Although not last night, there's actually a tornado warning on Cape Cod if you were watching yeah. that last night. And we're trying to figure out if the damage in Harwich, with a lot of trees down, whether that was actually from a tornado. That would be really unusual because there's only been two in history <laughs> on Cape Cod. Um, that was a history starting in 1950. Anyway, um, so we do get them, um, and we get big ones. And the big ones can come about once every 10 years or so. Probably remember in 2011, the big Springfield Munson tornado. There was uh, a very big uh, EF3 tornado. I'll show you what that means in a minute. But, um, <clears throat> Those big tornadoes come about once every 10 years. The granddaddy of them all, which I'll show you later in the presentation, was the Worcester tornado in 1953. That was the biggest one of all times. And since then, we had uh, a big truck stop tornado out in Berkshire County in 1972. Um, it was a yeah, four tornado. The Worcester tornado was also a four. Um, the, uh, the scale goes up to five. I'll show you that in a minute. But anyway, um, and after that, we had the Windsor Locks tornado, which I just showed you, in, in Connecticut in 1979. And then there was the Hamden, Connecticut tornado in 1989. And then we had the Great Barrington tornado out in Berkshire County in 1995. And 2011, we had the Springfield tornado. 14, we had a smaller one, but in Revere, that uh, was a yeah, two tornado. So the big ones generally come every 10 years on average or so. so the last one was 2011. It's 2021. We're due in about two years <laughs> for another big one. Now, this is a totally separate topic. We're not doing hurricanes today, but while I'm on statistics, um, what was the last hurricane that hit New England? Anybody remember? It actually Bob. hit New England. Bob in 1979. Yes. No, we got Bob right, but not the year. 89? Almost. <laughs> Hurricane Bob. 91. 91. 1991. Hurricane Bob hit. So it's been 28 years since New England's been hit by a hurricane. And the average return period, if you go on the National Hurricane Center website, the average return period for a hurricane of any type uh, is about 13 years on southern for southern New England coast. So it's been 28 years. 
So we're actually more than double due for a hurricane. How about a major hurricane? That means a category three on the Saffir Simpson scale. The hurricane scale, you know, they always talk about category. Category goes from zero, or actually one to five. Okay, five is just catastrophic, like Andrew in 1992, um, Camille in 1969. Those were examples of fives. We've never had a five up here. We've never actually had a four up in New England, but we've had threes, and that's bad enough. Three is considered a major hurricane with sustained winds of 125 miles an hour and gusts way above that. So when was the last major hurricane, category three, that hit southern New England directly? What about 1938? That was the biggest one. No. But there was one after that. There were a couple after that. 55? Almost, yeah, 1954. 55. I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> 1954 was Hurricane Carol. 1954. Oh my God! So that's married that day. Yep. So that's been um, what 65 years, and the average return period for a major hurricane in Southern New England, on average, is 62 years. So we're not only due for a hurricane, but we're due for a major hurricane. You no, know, that's a whole other presentation. But nobody has any idea how powerful a major hurricane would be. Just as an example, 80% um, of all the trees in southern New England would be knocked down. That's four out of every five trees. So when you go home tonight, picture only one out of every five trees left standing. That's what it would look like after a major hurricane. And um, hospitals would be out of power um, for more than 30 days. After 30 days, they would be only, uh, uh, it was like 40% uh, of them would be out, 60% would be still functioning. But that's after a month. Bad time to have a heart attack, to have surgery planned. Um, and that goes for emergency services too, police, fire. Um, really unbelievable amount of um, uh, damage that would happen. So, um, <laughs> let's see. So that's hurricanes. <laughs> but I, I digress. Anyway, the other point is they can come in cycles. Right? I'm a meteorologist. We try to predict day one. <laughs> okay, not a climatologist. They study, you know, climatology over hundreds of years. You know, terrible profession to be in. You, you make a prediction, and then you die. <laughs> and you, and you never know whether you were right or not. <laughs> that's a good point. So that's climatology. Okay. So I mean, so I don't get into the subject of climate change, global warming, this and that. All I can tell you is that things, for a long period of time, have come in cycles. 1950, you know, I get this question all the time. 2011 was terrible, right? We had tropical storm. Irene came up, gave a lot of damage, flooding like crazy in Vermont, you know, Northwest Massachusetts. That was followed by the Springfield Munson tornado. And I don't know if you remember, in October that year, we had we had snow cover with like 30 inches of snow in October out in the Berkshires. And, you know, so what's happening? In 2014, everybody's asking, we had the Revere tornado, and then in 2015, we had 130 inches of snow in a month. <laughs> Remember that one? Um, so, but things come in bad cycles. In 1953, that was pretty bad, right? The Worcester tornado. Yeah. 1954 was really bad. We had Hurricane Carol and Hurricane Edna back to back in the same week. Wow. And in 1955, you mentioned 1955 before. That was a bad year, too, because we had tropical storm Connie. Connie came by and saturated the ground. And that was followed also 12 days later by tropical storm Diane. And Diane created massive flooding across the entire region. And so Connie, Diane, Carol, Edna, the Worcester tornado, that was all in a three-year period. So my point is just that things can happen really bad. 
after the Revere tornado in 2014, everybody was asking, well, that's terrible. Boston hasn't had a tornado in 50 years. Things are crazy around here, I think. What was that? Boston hasn't had a tornado in 50 years. That was the point. They were due. So, okay. Now we'll move on. But oh, that smells really good. <laughs> no, because the gout in the toe is probably not going to be too good with me. I'll make you a plain cheese one, not the pepperoni one. <laughs> a little bit later. I could probably do one plain cheese one. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to starve. <laughs> anyway. Let's move on. So I already kind of described this. This is an old slide uh, before, uh, you know, from several years ago. But back when I made this, Worcester County had had 34 tornadoes. And the last one had been the Princeton tornado in oh <laughs> you don't have to do it. in uh, in Father's Day of 2001 that was out by Mount Wachusett and um, I mean at the time the last one on the list was 1990 and then this one happened in 2011 we had said that they were due and sure enough statistics proved it right. In Hampton County, out in western Massachusetts, it, this was an older thing, 51 years, there have been 16 tornadoes, still about one every three years. The last one on the list had been 1992 at the time, and then what happened in 2011, Mother Nature made up for it. So, you can do a lot of things with statistics. One of them is, take the percentage of violent tornadoes, that's the fours and the fives, as a percentage of all tornadoes. So this is not the Midwest. We don't get a lot of tornadoes, so the denominator is going to be small. So you're dividing by a smaller number. But even that said, Connecticut, not too far from here, ranks second in the country in terms of the proportion of violent tornadoes that we get, right behind Kentucky. Now Massachusetts is 16th on the list, at 1.6 of all tornadoes being the violent kind. Whereas Connecticut is 4% of all tornadoes being the violent kind. And um, so we don't get them very often, but the national average is only 1%. So both Connecticut and Massachusetts are above the national average. So when we get them, I don't get them that often, but they can be really strong. So it's good that you're here to learn about. So here's a list, I already talked about a lot of them. Worcester Tornado killed 94 people back in 1953. 1,228 people injured. That was, a F, that was a F4 tornado. They changed the scale, this is the Fujita scale, and it's now called the Enhanced Fujita scale. But anyway, um, that was before we had any warnings, it was actually before we had any radar. The MIT radar was just being invented and developed back in 1953 and very crudely showed a little curving thing that looked like a hook and it was determined to eventually have been a tornado. Now, that was a big tornado. Uh, anybody remember that? <laughs> yeah. There were, there were frozen mattresses found in Boston Harbor that had been wafted 70,000 feet into the sky and came down in, in, in Boston Harbor <laughs> from the Worcester tornado. And uh, yeah, checkbooks, and you know, it was just pretty horrific. Um, so here's the list of all the others. And the last deadly one was Springfield Monson in 2011. He had three, three people killed and 200 people injured. Um, so let's switch gears now and talk about lightning a little bit. So lightning, um, very dangerous, right? <laughs> um, so there was a study done just in the northeast states of where the most injuries occurred and fatalities. And 50% um, of the locations were undocumented, but of the other 50%, the number one bad place to be 
It is in open fields, ballparks, and playgrounds. You were probably thinking under trees, right? Well, that's number two. But it's the open fields, ballparks, and playgrounds, because you're the tallest object around. And um, that's where you know, people outdoors, it's very, very deadly. Under trees, on the water, water conducts electricity, not a good place to be. Um, fishing, boating, swimming, that kind of thing. Golfing, that's another bad one because you're holding a little metal lightning rod. Um, and um, now, talking on the telephone is only 1.6%, so we tell all of our weather spotters, give us a call. Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> No, and wait until it's safely passed, right? Now, actually, cell phones are okay, but corded phones that are plugged into the wall, not good to be on during an electrical storm. Uh, also, taking showers, anything like that, it travels through the plumbing, even inside a house. Uh, not a good idea. We've been to the YMCA and various other places, tell people that even though it's an indoor swimming pool, and the lightning is outdoors, you need to be out of the pool. And they have it in their, in their uh, rules to, you know, because it can go through the plumbing system and, uh, and get you inside an indoor pool as well. And I also talked to campgrounds. My son was at a, well, years ago, at an a overnight camp up in New Hampshire, and they had a lake there, and. They were very proactive. They got people off the lake when they could hear thunder at all. They have a lot of rules, by the way. When thunder roars, go indoors. <laughs> you heard that? If you can hear it, fear it. If you can see it, flee it. All kinds of things. So, um, the, the camp office, though, said, OK, they get everybody off the water. But then where do they go? They go to their bunks, and they congregate like outside the bunks which is not good, or they go in and take showers, which is not good. So, it's a perpetual safety thing. My job is the warning coordination meteorologist. That doesn't mean that I have to be there for every morning, <laughs> but my, I interface with all of our customers, which is everybody, police, fire, the media, emergency managers, um, seniors, school children, mariners, aviators, everybody is our customer. Um, to get the word out about preparedness. So this is how storms form. Typical summer day, right? Cumulus. Now that's not the ice cream truck. <laughs> this is the Massachusetts Emergency Alert Network. Our office must have issued something, huh? That's right now. That's a, another tornado warning for Barnstable County right now. Well, my day is going to be really long. It is. This for my daughter. Yeah, it's in the uh, Falmouth area. Falmouth and even the northern portion of, uh, yeah, we don't of Martha's Vineyard. Now that's really unusual. That's strange. Yeah, so um, <laughs> something like bringing reality to the presentation. Huh? There's actually a tornado warning right now in Cape Cod. There was one last night. Okay, so anyway. <laughs> uh, Typical summer day. Fair weather cumulus clouds form to heat the ground. They boil up like that, right? But then they continue to grow and grow into what are called cumulonimbus clouds. Nimbus means rain is coming out of it. Cumulo is the very cumulo <laughs> puffy stuff. Um, okay, so now in this case, you can look at it and see that it's a severe thunderstorm just by looking at it. Now, why is that? Here's the updraft. Every thunderstorm has an updraft. The air going up, the rain cools it. I mean, the uh, the rain droplets, they get bigger, 
They cool, they condense. Water vapor cools, condenses into water droplets. Okay, but the updraft suspends it this far up and they get bigger. And if it gets above the freezing level, they freeze and turn into hail, right? And now if you have strong winds aloft on a given day, all that rain that goes up here gets pushed over here. The strong winds grab it and so the rain comes down over here. And so the updraft and the downdraft are not in, in the same spot. A typical thunderstorm on a regular summer day, the updraft goes up, there's no strong winds aloft, so the downdraft comes down, and it cuts off the updraft. And the storm lasts 20 minutes, and it's not severe. But when there's strong winds aloft, what goes up gets blown all the way over here, and the downdraft does not cut off the updraft. And it can go on and on and last for a couple hours or longer and get bigger and bigger. So if that updraft is so strong that it punches through this, this is called the, like the top of the thunderstorm. That's the anvil that forms. And this is because the troposphere where all the weather occurs is down here. And the stratosphere is up here. The stratosphere is very stable. So it acts as a lid on everything. And that's why it flattens out at the top. Because it's reached the stratosphere. But just by looking at it, just by looking at it, if you can see this. See, this is a, called an overshooting top. It's overshooting the anvil level, the top of the storm. And just by looking at it, you see a big bubble on top of the storm, and it persists for five or ten minutes. That's a severe thunderstorm, because it's telling you the updraft is so strong that it's punching through the, into the stable stratosphere on a given day. Now, here's a trick question. Which is more severe, a 30,000-foot thunderstorm or a 60,000-foot thunderstorm? Okay. Because I said it was a trick question? Yeah. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Actually, it depends on a given day. In the springtime in southern New England, things are cooler. And so, you know, cool things compress and warm things expand. And so everything's kind of compressed, and the whole storm might only be 30,000 feet. So if the tropopause level, this anvil level, is 25,000 feet on that day, and the storm goes up to 30,000 feet, then it's punched through that 25,000 lid. So it could be just as severe as in Florida if it's summertime, it's hot and humid, and this top of the storm level might be 60,000 feet on that day. So a 65,000 foot storm would be severe. It has to be above the level of the, the top of the atmosphere, the tropopause. And we send out weather balloons every day to measure what that is. But you can just see it just by walking outside. If you see this overshooting top, and assuming you don't have buildings and trees in the way, you can see everything. Then you see the top of the storm, and that would mean that it could be severe with large hail, damaging winds, maybe even a tornado. Everybody understand that? No? Okay, good. One little bite, it's down. <laughs> That's good. Anybody know how hot a lightning bolt is? I've never measured it. This is just what the book says. <laughs> oh, hot. Hot. 50,000. Pretty hot. What was that? 50,000. 50,000 degrees? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that's a good guess because that's the answer. Oh 50,000 degrees. Oh, wow. <laughs> she got hit by one. Wow. <laughs> good guess. <laughs> 50,000 degrees. Celsius. Celsius and Fahrenheit are about the same at that temperature. That's five times hotter than the surface of the sun. The surface of the sun is 11,000 degrees. 
So, yeah, amazing. You can be struck by lightning and still revive by mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. There's a lot of things about lightning. <laughs> it's kind of like a whole other presentation. But I want to show you because it's one of the biggest killers. The number two killer nationwide is lightning, weather-related. What do you think the number one is? Flash floods. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, because people drive through flooded waters or they get stuck like or they're outside in a campground and get washed away. Mostly in the Rocky Mountains, things like that, um, where there's big sloping terrain. Anyway, lightning strikes the tallest objects. There's the Prudential Tower. But the good news is they put a, a lightning rods at the top of the building, which safely ground it to the ground. The Empire State Building in New York City gets struck 30 times in a row sometimes. You ever hear uh, lightning never strikes twice in the same place? That's not true. Once it digs its path through the atmosphere, <coughs> it likes to dig the very same path. It's much easier. And so 30 times in a row sometimes that gets struck. But it doesn't always strike the tallest objects. There's this space shuttle on the launch pad and, and lightning striking at the base of the launch pad. Or here's the tallest thing in the parking lot here, and lightning struck 50 feet away. So it's not always true. There's the lightning striking the top of a church steeple in downtown Providence. Likes to strike metal, and it likes to strike the tallest objects. Here's a jetliner near Osaka, Japan. And um, I've been on a plane before, and you hear a little pop, and lightning hits the plane. It's not terribly dangerous usually, but in this case, it, the plane served as the initiator of the lightning strike because it went both upward and downward from the plane. And um, it was right near the airport, so they were able to turn around 46 people on board, and they were, uh, they were fine, but it did damage some of the cockpit instrumentation, not very good for an airplane. So, um, really to fly in thunderstorms, you can have other things too, like downbursts and things. So, uh, so as a safety measure, they have a new rule, the FAA, they uh, take a picture in a cockpit every 15 minutes, and um, you happen to have the very first picture um, <clears throat> from, the, from the cockpit there. Uh, <laughs> Planes coming right out. Of the <laughs> I told you the jokes are corny. <laughs> what's the first? What's the first thing you should do when you feel that electrical charge? Pray. Your hair starts. Pray. Your hair starts. Pray. Thank you, but I'll do the jokes. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, but she's funny. So that's good. Um, when your hair stands on end to go meet that electrical charge, that's not a good sign. These people were up at Mount, Mount uh, no, Morro Rock at Sequoia National Park in 1975 in California. And um, lightning struck five minutes later. You'd think it would be instantaneous, but it was five minutes later. Now they ran down the mountain to safety, thank goodness, but one person was killed and eight people injured that replaced them on that same platform within those five minutes. And this is a sad story. Because uh, I actually tried to get this guy as a speaker. He's, he's a rock star now in uh, California. Kind of looks like it. <laughs> anyway, um, but sadly, his little brother passed away um, from all kinds of depression. That was a result of a lightning strike. Um, it was, uh, it does things to your brain. It's not just, are you killed or are you okay? It can be lifelong debilitation. So, um, and therefore it goes underreported because the newspaper articles only have the people that went to the hospital that day. But a year later, they, they, are still not feeling right, or they can't sleep right, or all kinds of problems. So, um, 
So you should definitely avoid tall objects, right? Uh, trees are not good to be under. Um, there could be side flashes. Um, if you're in a, a forest with lots of trees, that's actually better than an isolated tree. But try to stay away from trees as much as possible. There's lightning striking a tree. Okay, but if you look closely, there's lightning going upward from the tree. See that? Yeah. And there's a power line out here. If you look really closely, there's lightning coming upward from the top of the power line, too. This happens like instantaneously, so you don't see it. But lightning goes both upward and downward. But when it meets the big downward one, that's where you get the big bolt. Okay, and it's the most dangerous. How many times have you heard, you know, crouch down, make yourself as small a target as possible? No. <laughs> Praying is probably better. But that's, yeah, when thunder roars, go indoors. The only safe place is indoors. Okay? You don't want to be crouching down. If you make, if you think about it, actually, lightning coming from 40,000 feet up in the sky, right? Do you think it makes a difference whether it's 39,999 feet because you're crouching or 40,000 feet? Probably not. Um, so, again, the main thing is to go indoors. There's a covering your head. That's a tornado safety rule, not a lightning safety rule. Okay, if you're stuck outdoors, cover your head and pray. That's the, uh, the post office. What? The post office. That's the post office? They roll the cops. They roll the cops. Oh, wow. I thought it was the sound of it. We're already just We're indoors, that's correct. Right. Good point. Now, if you're caught outside, uh, stay away from metal fences, metal wires, lightning travels long distances. I had to give this presentation at the, uh, oh, what was the name of that? Oh, up on Route 1 in, in Lynn, there was a, a famous uh, steakhouse. The Hilltop. Hilltop, yes, yeah, thank right. you. At lunchtime. <laughs> and, uh, oh, it was, I'm sorry. <laughs> but the cows didn't know any better. They were kind of grazing along the fence, and lightning travels long distances along fences. One out of every eight lightning strikes occurs outside the rain area. So here's uh, everybody seeks shelter when it's raining, but it's the bolt from the blue that kind of comes out of the side of the thunderstorm after all the rain has occurred. That's where people really get killed because you don't expect it. Um, good news is I've worked with uh, lots of places and the uh, Six Flags theme park out in Agawam, they start shutting down rides. They have their own lightning detection system. And they start shutting down rides like the big tall roller coasters and Ferris wheels when lightning is within uh, 10 miles of there. And that's good because 10 miles is about how far it can strike the farthest documented case is 34 miles. So it's actually almost the state of Rhode Island. <laughs> you could be on the beach in Newport and struck by a thunderstorm over Providence. Wow. Think about that. Wow. So if you can hear thunder, you're close enough to be struck. Just another picture of rain and lightning occurring outside the rain area. Our weather spotters sent this to us. You see anything dangerous here? Maybe not the, the not the sharpest tool in the shed. <laughs> um, yeah, these are just a fraction of a second video that was slowed down, and you can see that this guy was right where this transformer pole is, right where lightning struck, just a fraction of a second before or after he got there. If you can see it, flee it. 
Maybe he's trying to flee it. I don't know. <laughs> it looks like he's just out for a jog, though. Big implication for the macho baseball coaches and soccer coaches. I used to be one of them. You know, okay, the rain has stopped, so let's get out there and play, right? Yeah. But it's not the coolest thing to say, you know, but Mr. Field says that we should wait 30 minutes until the storm is safely passed. But that's what you should be saying. Don't let them go back out on the field. And if they all took shelter in the dugout, that's not smart either. It's completely open. Um, you should wait a full 30 minutes until it's safely passed. How about football? Is it just baseball? No. <clears throat> Have you ever heard of Michael Vick? Plays on the, uh, I don't know where he plays now, Atlanta still? <laughs> Up here. Um, but he used to play in college at the Virginia Tech Pokies. And here's the Virginia Tech uh, Stadium with 50,000 people in the stadium. The lightning struck six tenths of a mile behind the stadium right at the opening kickoff. The game was canceled. Um, but that's too close. Imagine if this was the old Foxborough Stadium with the metal seats. That? <laughs> the, not everyone can fit into the concourse in these little openings here. And these lightning arresters really didn't do a job, did they? <laughs> um, or would they? So you have to be aware. You have to have a radar app on your phone. <coughs> If you can hear thunder, go into the concourse right away and try to work with the stadiums to get them to put something on the screen warning you that this is coming well ahead of time. Well, let me just say my, my lightning story before we get into a couple other things. I, I live in Foxborough, and I don't know if you know, Foxborough music department is fabulous. I mean, it's like world renowned. The Foxborough Music Department. My son played in the jazz ensemble and in the marching band, and they got to actually uh, play, and they were invited. Foxborough High School was invited to play at the Obama inauguration um, at, at JFK Center in, in Washington. He was playing like with Oprah was in the audience. That's pretty impressive. And also, won, they won, the jazz ensemble won the, uh, the Ellington Award, which let them play at Lincoln Center. And he was on stage playing with Dave Brubeck and with um, uh, Wynton Marsalis. So that was quite the experience. So the point is that Foxborough Music Program is unbelievable. And they take it very seriously. So right before school started, they're practicing out on the blacktop underneath trees um, for, for the marching band practice that starts right after school starts, the football game. And I forgot that he would, my son was a freshman at the time, <laughs> and, but I knew the music director, I won't say his name, but I'm being videotaped. <laughs> but the thing is, there was a, a sea breeze coming in from the east and there was lightning striking in Sharon, just east of Foxborough, and it was coming in from the east in an unusual direction. You could hear the thunder. I said, you know, I bet they're still out there at marching band practice. So I drove to the high school, and sure enough, everybody's there. And I said to the assistant director, you know, this isn't really safe. He said, you tell the director. <laughs> so I did. Um, and my son's out there like, oh my god. <laughs> I mean, he knew it wasn't safe. He was worried himself. But, you know, so I had forgotten that he didn't know who I was. I knew who he was, the director. So I went up and I said, in between measures, I waited till it was a stopping point. And I said, you know, um, from the National Weather Service, and this isn't really safe. It's like thunder. And his expression was priceless, like four different expressions in 10 seconds. <laughs> the first one was, you have the nerve to interrupt me at my marching band practice? The second one was, why is the federal government here at my marching band practice? The third one was, well, 
And I don't know, if my kids get injured, I could be in big trouble. And then he ordered everybody off the field. I was so happy. Big clap of thunder as they were rolling the timpani into the building. Wow. It took five minutes still. Um, never rained. I was hoping for a deluge, but that's too close. You know, the point is that adults can be just as um, stupid, right? <laughs> Oblivious. Into music, not into weather. Um, so, so there, that's my story. <laughs> anyway, now I threw around the word severe many times in this presentation, but I never actually defined it. So here's the fun part where I get to pick on two people in the audience. To, all I need is a yes or a no, it's very simple. Okay, who wants to volunteer? Okay, right here in the blue shed. So here's the first question. Let's say lightning is striking the ground five million times per second, burns your house down to the ground, kills your neighbor and the dog. And you like the dog. Is that a severe thunderstorm? Yeah. Wait a minute, I didn't finish the question. <laughs> By our definition. Final answer? Yeah. Yes? All right, well, thank you for playing. <laughs> Why the heck not? Didn't I just say it was the second, the second killer nationwide? It was an isolated area. Huh? It was only an isolated area. No. Why wouldn't we issue a severe thunderstorm warning for a storm that's got five million lightning strikes? It's not meeting certain criteria. Which criteria is that? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would think um, wind. Is that number? Is that one? That's one. Oh, ah, cool. What's um, the other one? <laughs> Very good. That's good. I don't know. Right, that's pretty good. All right, so the thing is, what is it that causes the thunder? The weather. The lightning. lightning. It heats the air to 50,000 degrees and causes like a little sonic boom, right? That's the thunder comes from lightning. So if we were to warn, if lightning was a criteria for warning, we'd have to warn for every thunderstorm then nobody would believe us about the ones that uh, have the strong winds, maybe hail, or tornadoes even. So, <clears throat> okay, whoops. So yeah, so large hail damaging winds, that's severe. But we can't warn for every thunderstorm that has lightning. Nobody would believe us for the real ones. So that's not doesn't mean it's not important, obviously. Um, it would cause us to issue a special warrant weather statement that would scroll on the screen. If you watch the Weather Channel, it scrolls red on the screen. Um, and we could say there's like unbelievable Armageddon type of lightning out there. Okay. But it won't cause us to issue a severe thunderstorm warning. It's severe. I mean, lightning is not severe by our definition. Okay. So who else wants to volunteer? One other question. Oh, I need a yes or a no. All right, you volunteer. 500 inches of rain. I know it says 50, but I'm making it 500. 500 inches of rain in 10 minutes, and all of southern New England is floating away, and it's from a thunderstorm. Okay, is that a severe thunderstorm? I don't know if it's a severe flood, but. Um... Correct, but what's the answer? No. No? Final answer? Yep. That's great. Nobody said, nobody had the hall. I was always, this is the final answer. I was always waiting for the, somebody changed their mind, then I say, and I don't want a meteorologist answer. I want to read it. Anyway. Okay, so you are correct. Uh, let us know about that. Okay, so why the heck not? Then I say, flash floods are the number one thunderstorm related killer. But the thing is, it's not a severe thunderstorm because rain occurs with every thunderstorm. Um, how many times do you hear on the radio, you know, uh, Starro Drive is, is, is 
there's a severe thunderstorm causing you know flooding on Star Drive. Okay, to us that's a thunderstorm with heavy rain, but not a severe thunderstorm because rain is not a criteria either. Now it'll cause us to issue a flash flood warning pronto. It'll keep our service hydrologists busy for decades, probably the rest of her career, but not a severe thunderstorm. Okay, so then what is severe? That's winds that are greater than 58 miles an hour, or hail that's greater than one inch in diameter. So one inch is about the size of a U.S. quarter. Okay, so hail that's a quarter, or winds that are 58 miles an hour. And uh, of course a tornado or any <coughs> widespread damage counts as uh, severe. So we have these things called watches and warnings, right? Severe thunderstorm watch was issued yesterday, but not for here, it was for Connecticut, Rhode Island. So a watch, which is worse, a watch or a warning? Warning. warning. A warning, right? Because like for, for a younger crowd, I say, you know, which is worse, you know, and if your mother says, I'm warning you, that's pretty bad, right? <laughs> uh, the other thing is a watch kind of means you know, keep a watch on things, watch out. Um, um, whereas a warning means watch out. I mean, that, that's a bad way of saying it. But anyway, a warning means that it's imminent or occurring. We see it on the radar. A watch means it could happen. Go about your normal business. Just be aware that things could go south pretty quickly. Okay? But a warning means it's occurring. And if you saw the slide before, or tail and damaging winds. That's the answer. That's what a severe thunderstorm watch means. Now, a tornado can occur in a severe thunderstorm watch area. It doesn't know what we call the watch or a warning. So you always have to be on the lookout for that, too. So let's talk then about the specific threats then is the hail, the wind, and the tornadoes. So the hail, I already told you, it goes up and it, the rain droplets freeze when it gets above the freezing level and they turn into hail. And depending how strong that updraft is, that determines how big the hail is going to get. Because if it's a weaker updraft, it forms the hail and then it falls kind of down through that updraft. But if a stronger updraft grabs it again, it can go up and refreeze into a bigger hailstone. And even stronger updraft will keep it up suspended even longer. Where it gets bigger and bigger until it finally falls through the updraft. So we actually know how big the, how strong the updraft has to be to, to create various size scale stones. And so uh, something that's golf ball size has a 56 mile an hour updraft. And something that's a little bit bigger than a baseball is a um, 100 mile an hour updraft. So imagine the air coming together and going up faster than, like I used to say, Pedro Martinez's fastball. I mean, think about that. 100 miles an hour straight up. That's how fast the updraft is going in these organized storms to create baseball-sized hail. So anytime that you have golf ball-sized hail or larger, even if there's not a tornado warning, you have to start thinking that it's capable of producing a tornado. So would this be severe, do you think? Yes. yes. That's uh, four, four inches across from here to here, almost. About four inches in diameter. Remember, one inch is the criteria. That's about the size of a quarter. That's the severe definition. 58 miles an hour or a quarter size hail. So we have weather spotters that are sending us pictures nowadays. One thing we say that we don't want our weather spotters to ever report is marble-sized hail. Because a lot of different sized marbles out there, right? And so always try to put it in terms of coinage or you know, some kind of object other than marbles. It can do a lot of damage. So this is the reporting, wind reporting. So now if we go to straight line winds, <coughs> Remember, 58 miles an hour. Every thunderstorm has an updraft and a downdraft. 
but a really strong downdraft is called a downburst. Okay, and you've heard that term before, right? A downburst. Um, sometimes you hear the word microburst. A microburst is a narrow downburst covering less than two and a half miles in, in width. And a macroburst is a wide downburst. Downburst is the generic term. It can either be a microburst or a macroburst, depending on the damage slot. Now here's typical downburst damage. It can do a lot of damage. Look what it did to the radar tower here. Wow. <laughs> downburst form where the rain falls down and evaporates into dry air. So when you step out of the shower, you feel cold, right? Because evaporation is a cooling process. The water is evaporating and you feel cold. So when the rain falls into dry air, it evaporates, gets colder, and cold air is heavier than the surrounding air, so it rushes down to the ground and forms a downburst. So it's especially true when the air is really dry. You don't get it that often when it's really moist and yucky out. The strongest downburst ever was 175 miles an hour. That was in Moorhead City, North Carolina. 175 miles an hour is Pretty strong, right? <laughs> That's the equivalent of like a you know four tornado. So downburst can cause a lot of bad damage. In Worcester in 1998 in Shrewsbury, there was 104 mile an hour gust, and in Brockton 104 miles an hour coincidentally in 1996 as well. So we tell our weather spiders though, a lot of people are going to call that a tornado. But don't report a tornado unless you see an actual tornado coming down. Report you what it is that happens. The trees down. I remember one. Um, a roaring sound. It sounded like a freight train. That's my other favorite one. 175 mile an hour winds are going to cause a roaring sound. Um, how about twisted trees? Twisted road signs? Again, that could be the angle of attack of the downburst winds coming down. It doesn't have to be a tornado. It could be the center of gravity of the big oak tree was leaning over to begin with. And then it got hit by strong straight line winds and twisted. You had a question? Yes, uh, how do you measure a downburst? The how speed you, of a downburst? How do you measure it? Yeah. I mean, um, well, the only way to measure it is if you have an anemometer, a wind speed indicator at your house. <laughs> um, our Doppler radar can indicate the strength of the winds as viewed by radar. It's an estimation. It's not you know, an actual wind. I mean, yeah, you can just the, these things actually went through places that had. We actually have a lot of weather spotters. We have eight thousand trained weather spotters across southern New England, and a lot of them have. Another warning, huh? All right, so anyway, um, let's see. So here's what I mean. As viewed from the air, uh, a downburst, let's say the thunderstorm produces gusts that come straight down, and then the damage spreads out in a forward direction usually because there's strong straight line winds in the first place. So, but it's diverging damage. That's what it looks like, where it's spreading apart. It comes down and spreads out. As opposed to a tornado, where everything likes to blow in toward low pressure. So you'd see everything blowing in toward it instead of blowing outward. And it has rotation. So here's one coherent track. And if you look closely, all the trees are uh, or wheat or whatever that is being blown in toward the center, converging as opposed to diverging. So after the fact, especially if there's any injuries or if it's a really big storm, 
we go out and investigate and try to determine whether what direction the trees are facing and whether uh, there was low pressure, might have been people's ears popping, or of, uh, you know, different indicators of a pressure difference. Or if you're lucky enough to see circular tracks, then you know it was a tornado. Now here, back in 1996, we went to Brockton, and there was a downburst, 104 mile an hour wind. So I took these pictures. There's two pine trees down in front of this guy's house. 104 mil uh, mile an hour gusts, 60 people injured, but nobody was killed. $4 million worth of damage. See the tree sliced in half? I got to fly in the WBZ helicopter. Never again. <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with the pilot. Not, you know, nothing. It's just that next time I will only fly in a helicopter where there are two people there. Because I kept thinking, if this guy has a heart attack, I don't know how to fly this thing. <laughs> so, um, but here's Route 27 in Brockton. There's those same two trees down in front of this guy's house. It looked a lot worse from the ground than it did from the air. Most of the trees are standing. That's New England. Um, but here's another tree blown down in the same direction. See that over here? Another tree right here in the same direction. You could find your way home without a compass because all the trees were blown down in the same direction. That's a downburst or a microburst. And here's a forest in Abington, and the same side of each tree was sheared off. You'd think if it was a tornado, there'd be some on this side, some on that side. But it was all on the same side. But this got us going. How did the leaves get all over the front of the house and all over the back of the house? The thing is, there were no shingles missing. There wasn't any damage to the house itself. You'd think if a tornado happened, something would be wrong with the house, other than leaves on it. And um, so this is consistent with a downburst. The strong winds bounce off the ground, create these various swirls and eddies that plaster the leaves onto the house. But it was not a tornado. Another shot of the trees in one direction. See that? Uh, it took me on a nice tour afterwards um, and flew over to Fenway Park. <clears throat> and um, let's skip over that one. Now we're going to go to, uh, real quickly here, through tornadoes. Okay, that was a microburst. A tornado is a violently rotating column of air on the ground, in contact with the ground. If it's not in contact with the ground, we call it a, uh, if it's just up in the air, funnel cloud, yes. When it touches the ground, it's a tornado. When it lifts up again, it's a funnel cloud. When it touches down, it's a tornado. And we already told you about the EF scale. EF1 can peel off some roofs. And EF3 can overturn trains and uproot forests. And EF5, doesn't matter where you are, um, this is the Wichita Falls, Texas tornado. The only people that survived this tornado had sought shelter in the bank ball. That was a bad one. So this is the enhanced Fujita scale. That's what it's called. As little as 65 miles an hour, that's the EF0 on up to more than 200 with the EF5. And EF2, for example, can knock the, the roof off an apartment complex, and EF3 the side walls of an apartment complex. And an EF5, even if you're in your basement, is not a safe place. Um, we already went through some of these local tornadoes here. The granddaddy of them all was in 1953, the Worcester Tornado. We talked about that earlier. It formed out in Petersham near the Quabbin Reservoir. It was on the ground for 46 miles and uh, 84 minutes. There's a book, 90, 84 Minutes, 94 Lives. And um, <clears throat> it was 1,000 yards wide. That's like 10 football fields. Think about that. Um, now, why is your basement not safe? Well, generally it's safe. But you have five tornado can completely wipe out the whole house. And so no everything goes in, there's nothing left. Even, I mean, everything would be flying into the basement. So, I mean, it's, <coughs> it's the safest you could do. Chances are you're not going to have an EF5 tornado. It's like once every yeah. 
this was a hundred years. You know? But um, and we don't have storm cellars here in New England, so that's the best place. It's underground, <laughs> but um, the next best place would be in the basement. Twenty-six people killed on these three streets alone in the burn coat section of northern Worcester. Uh, there's more Worcester tornado damage. This is uh, Senator John F. Kennedy surveying the tornado damage in Worcester. This is Assumption College, a big brick building. So, uh, yeah, when it starts knocking apart brick buildings, then that, that leads to the determination of EF 4 or 5. Now, sometimes there's only a severe thunderstorm warning in effect. This was Great Barrington in 1995. The fairgrounds in Great Barrington. Uh, white corrugated plastic roofing material and a part and a racing ticket were found 45 miles away in Belchertown. That's a new meaning to the word mobile station. <laughs> Just kidding. That's my humor again, sorry. <laughs> now you can tell that it was, uh, was not an EF5 tornado because there was one pump left standing as part of the roof. So, but it blew away some other pumps. And the damage cost an arm and a leg. <laughs> Which is hilarious now because we've died for those prices, right? Anyway, I got to, this was my first disaster survey back in 1995 and we went out and saw this big truck smashed into this big wise supermarket creating that new entryway. And um, terrible sight at the cemetery. This was the the media circus the day afterwards, and I don't know if this is the Secret Service taking a picture of me taking a picture. Just kidding. Anyway, um, this is your former Federal Emergency Management Agency director, Louis Lisa, working hand in hand with your Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency director, David Rodham, and. Maybe not the best view of the Western Massachusetts emergency. <laughs> John Pappas. And he, he knows I get that, that presentation. <laughs> I took this picture, and it's actually my favorite picture from this event. This is the back of the mobile station. Yeah, I'll just be a couple more minutes just so you know. Um, this is the back of the mobile station. Now you see this big metal pole that used to say mobile on it? Blowing in toward the center right there. Now look on the other side of the station. There's a big metal pole that used to say mobile on it blowing in toward the center. See that? So they're all blowing in toward the center. That proves that it was low pressure. Everything likes to blow in toward low pressure. It went right through the heart of the mobile station. But now I'm not a good judge of distance, but the width of the mobile station, I don't know, 50, 80 feet by the time I walked from here to here. But it was three to 500 yards where the tornado did damage on the mountainside beyond that. So that tells us this is a small scale rotation within the main rotation, which is why one house can be left standing and the one right next to it totally destroyed. There's lots of little rotations within the main rotation in a big tornado. So that was interesting. This four by four was driven right through the car, ended up right there. It peeled back the foam rubber seat cushion and slowed it down just enough so that the driver escaped with a serious hip injury. It was almost a fourth fatality, though. This is Massachusetts, not Kansas. So, um, now this was the day after. Everybody out, the eggs and the milk were untouched. <laughs> um, I don't know if somebody planted it there. I don't know. And if you look at the radar from 2011, this was the big tornado out in Monson, and this has what we call a hook echo. It's the rain and the hail 
and it's wrapping around the tornado circulation. And when you see a little ball like that at the end, that's actually what we call a debris ball. That's actually trees and buildings and houses that are being wafted into the air. Um, that's the reflectivity, how hard it's raining. All of these are raindrops. And our radar is way out here in Norton, and we're looking out to the west. But the Doppler part of Doppler radar shows you the wind speed inside the storm, whether those raindrops are coming toward or away from the radar. And so we color and code it, and the blues and the greens off the bottom of the scale are rushing toward Taunton, and they're right next to the reds and the pinks off the other end of the scale going away from Taunton. So if this is coming toward and that's going away, and they're right next to each other, that's a tornado, and it happens to be right at the same spot if you overlay the two. Um, clearly a tornado, and this was actually 75 knots in and 68 knots out, which is 140-something knots times 1.15 gives you almost 160 miles an hour circulation that the radar is seeing from Taunton. So that tornado scoured the ground for 38 miles and ended up in Southbridge. And um, this is a NASA satellite which shows the track of the tornado from what was damaged all the way over here to Charlton is where it ended up. So we have other pictures of uh, two tornadoes at the same time over Lake Garfield. This was a weak EF1 tornado in 1997. Cheshire Fairgrounds in Swansea, New Hampshire. See, it was just made out of wood and aluminum, <coughs> not bricks. And this recycling facility in Greenfield, New Hampshire, had a two tornado go through, damaged the Great Brook Middle School in 1998. There was a microburst and a tornado went through Northampton and you can do damage to your house. This is a little tiny tornado in a cornfield this was how wide it was, <laughs> right there. A little tiny tornado. But it managed to pick up these little horse trailers and drag them in circular paths on the ground. So, <clears throat> and this was the Father's Day tornado of 2001 in Worcester County. Um, it was the remnants of Tropical Storm Allison with heavy rains coming through Attleboro, but all by itself up here, spawned by the tropical circulation or the remnants of it was this figure six and a nine right there and call that a hook echo and again blues coming toward norton and or taunton where the radar is still in taunton blues coming toward taunton reds and yellows going away from taunton there's a circulation there actually did some damage at the ground as well and uh this time my boss flew in the helicopter <laughs> So, one coherent track, but most people in the town had no idea the town had been hit by a tornado because most of the trees are standing, just this one coherent track. And look where it ended, right there, right before these $400,000 homes, right in here. But it ended right before that. Um, now, there were two homes in here where people were damaged. Um, the homes were damaged. And one of those houses had somebody that was a weather service spotter. They had been Skywarn trained. They waited their whole life to report this. And the phone line was dead. <laughs> so there's a case for being an amateur radio operator, right? You can get on your amateur radio and report it to us. So, last thing. You know how you can hear the roar of a tornado a mile away? With those big ears, she could hear it 10 miles away. Right? She heard a tornado watch was in effect because she was listening for later statements and further developments on NOAA weather radio, very precocious cat. Right? Weather radio broadcasts the weather information 24 hours a day. You can get it at your favorite electronics outlet. Um, or you can watch it on TV. But anyway, she heard that a tornado warning was in effect. Right? So she told all of her relatives that the storm was coming. So all the relatives knew the storm was coming. She uh, even told the dog. 
They're just greeting cards, okay? <laughs> but my demented mind kind of put them together into a little weather story. There was somebody from the ASPCA in one of my presentations who said, this is just horrible, you know. So I have to have this disclaimer that nobody was injured. <laughs> But soon the, the whole household knew the tornado was coming. Oh. Everyone was rushing their loved ones to save <laughs> So the preparedness cat decided to take protective action. She put the helmet on. The dog said, come on, let's get down to the basement. Let's get down to the basement. And sure enough, the tornado came. And everything was blown this away. <laughs> The duck was blown right out of the car, almost hit the tree. The cat was blown right through the car. Oh my God. Um, I didn't take it serious. Everyone lived happily ever after. And they lived to tell just how big that tornado actually was. See, I think it was this big. <laughs> the debate went on for centuries. Now I think it was this big. <laughs> So finally, the worst place to be is in your car, or in a mobile home. Tornadoes are attracted to mobile homes, not a good thing. Safest place, again, in the basement. If you don't have a basement or a storm cellar like this. And the next best place is on the lowest floor in the interior of the building. Put as many walls between you and the storm as possible. Okay, that's the safest place. I don't know if you've probably heard, bring a mattress in and put that over your head. I don't know about you, I have a king size mattress. <laughs> I don't think anyway. I'm going to get mine. <laughs> Just go in, put as many walls in the lowest floor, because the top floors get blown apart. Again, not a lightning safety rule, but a tornado safety rule if you're outdoors, cover your head. The worst place to put kids is in a school, is in the all purpose room, a gymnasium. Uh, the cafeteria because of these wide span roofs that can easily just collapse, even in a microburst. Low pressure in a tornado, right? So relatively high pressure inside my house, everything likes to blow toward low pressure, so my windows are going to open up and blow out toward the low pressure. So I better open up my windows to equalize that pressure that's what everybody thinks. Should I open up the windows and equalize the air pressure? Well, let me show you. There's the tornado. There's your house with the window open. <laughs> <laughs> the window doesn't care whether the windows open. Or not. Okay. 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 This is finally the lightning is striking at this place but everybody in the pool not safe right we need people to be proactive not reactive this place gets so much lightning that they even have a lightning detector right at the pool and two pool managers doing absolutely nothing to protect them what do you think should we cancel the storm cancel the game that'd be good if we cancel the storm cancel the game i don't know what do you think maybe well that's too late and this is, the, uh, yeah, okay. I did doggies. I did the cat, so I have to do the dogs, and then I'll leave you. Um, Dodger dogs, good dog, born in 2005, Scottish Terrier. He's alive, just a little shaken up. This is a D zero, a calm wind. The eyes are open, the ears are perky. Uh, this is a D one, a gentle breeze. Aww. And miles an hour. This is a D two, 25 miles an hour. The eyes are squinting and the hair is matted along the top of the head. This is a D3. 40 miles an hour, the eyes are shut and the mouth is wide open. I want to see if Dodger Dog withstanding 100 mile an hour wind test is alive, just a little shaken up. This is a different dog. Thank you.
all I have. That's a good question. Um, so that's a tricky question. You said, here was the question. When I hear there's lightning or thunder, should I unplug all my electrical appliances? Could you see the path right So the key part there was when I hear it. No, don't touch them. Because <laughs> that means you're close enough to be struck. If you're going to do it, and you see it on radar, and you know it's coming, but you don't hear it yet, that's when you should start unplugging things. And, um, yeah. So, I mean, you don't have to. Uh, hopefully they're in like a, uh, what do you call that? Uh, uninterruptible uh, power protector. surge protector or power supply. Uh, so chances are they'll be okay. But they could get fried. So something important like a TV or a computer, you probably want to unplug it until the storm should pass, but not when you're hearing the thunder. That's too late. <laughs> what about your refrigerator? No, I wouldn't do that. No. What about the houses grounded? Most houses are safe and they should be grounded. You know, but again, if you're near like a, the corded phones or um, even those, those like 800 meg or the, the, the wireless telephones, if you're close enough to the base station, you could get struck that way as well. You should not be doing the dishes or taking a shower when lightning is in the area. Just keep it chill in the middle of the house. That's fine. I mean, as long as you're not touching metal, if you're inside a car, by the way, that's safe. If you're inside a car, just stay there. Don't try to get out of the car and rush into Walmart you know, or the food store or get out of the food store into your car. I think I'll make it. With well, a metal shopping cart, famously. With a metal shopping cart. Now, I mean, you're much better to wait a half an hour, you know? What's the big deal? You can wait a half an hour until you don't hear any thunder for several minutes anymore. And um, rather than trying to chance it, that's where people get struck. That's right, that high is that just but when you're inside the car, what's safe is not the rubber tires that protect you. It's the metal hardtop shell of the car. That's what protects you. As long as you're, you know, if you've ever been to the Museum of Science, you see that guy inside the cage. It's called a Faraday cage. And as long as he's not touching the metal on the outside, lightning likes to travel on the outsides of the body. So it'll travel along the roof of the car and out down the sides of the car. It'll touch metal inside the car. But otherwise, you're safe. You had a, sorry. No, they, you, now the houses are getting struck by lightning. Does that mean they're not grounded, or what draws the lightning to? There's a, been a few houses that just get struck. Yeah, I mean a house can get struck like but anything else. You just, got a chimney to see what that is. Yeah, I don't know exactly what you know whether there's something that attracted one particular house over another, or just just the luck of a draw. Generally speaking. Lightning won't be attracted to a neighborhood unless there's like a water tower in the neighborhood. You know, like welcome to Whateverville. <laughs> that would preferentially strike toward that all the time. What about metal roofs? Um, what about the metal roofs that people are putting on their houses now? <laughs> oh my, oh my yeah, I, I don't know really. <laughs> I mean, it's probably not good. But the, the other thing is, um, you know, like when I give this talk to school children, they're worried about, you know, oh my God, I have braces. 
or or metal belt buckles, you know, would that preferentially come to me? It won't come to you because you have a metal belt buckle. If it does, it'll cause an extra burn, right? Or a watch or things like that. It's really it's not a it's not a clear cut thing at all. Um, in fact, there's a lot of research being done. Um, actually, a case where um, a guy was struck, took a direct strike of lightning, direct strike. He was in the hospital for 38 days and uh, in a coma, sorry, in a coma for 38 days. And, but he survived. And it was not a good situation. But um, they think that the reason he survived uh, was that he was wearing metal jewelry around his neck. I mean, it's possible that just enough of it flashed over from his head to the metal. I mean, this is just a theory that prevented it from being the brunt of the full strike. I don't know. He's, uh, all of his nerves were regenerating for two years, and that was really painful. Um, he wished he was dead. <laughs> but now he plays golf again and walks with a cane but he's alive and, and doing pretty well. And he has his own uh, website, now devoted to lightning safety, called, uh, what's it called? Struckbylightning.org. That's a great website. And uh, he's from, uh, he was struck on a golf course here in Pocasset, down in, uh, in Falmouth. And um, so it's quite the story, but, um, I mean, you can survive it. <laughs> and he, he has the latest statistics of every lightning strike around the entire world um, and, and what the circumstances were. So it's an interesting website. Anyway. I have a question about yeah. newer houses. Instead of a lot of metal uh, plumbing, uh, for pipes of plastic, the water can deduct the water. This new plumbing, impede any kind of electrical flow, let's say, to your sinks or your shower? Yeah, it's kind of beyond my expertise. I don't know. Okay. That's like a, you need an electrical engineer for that, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. How about the transformers on the telephone poles? Does it hit those? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. They get struck a lot, yeah. And that's where, when we get reports of trees down, we don't know if it's from wind or lightning. Or you know, wires that hit the trees. I was on a telephone with my daughter last night, and the lightning struck and knocked the phone right out of my hand and disconnected our phone. No wonder you came to a presentation. <laughs> oh, sorry. Glad you're here. <laughs> Not phone right out of my hand. Yeah, don't, it was a cord, And that's when the hurricane does a corded, a corded phone? No, a phone. cell phone. A cell phone? Well, not a cell phone, but like a... A, a hand phone. phone. Yeah, so that's one of those, uh, if you're close enough to the base station, yeah. you, you can be struck, and, you know, yeah. if you were near where the, where you charge it, yeah, that you can get that... Thing. If you were carrying it halfway through the house, you might not have had it No, I, the phone was like right there, and I was at the table here. Wow. Oh, yeah. So, case in point, stay away from phones. <laughs> or electrical storm of any kind. <laughs> yeah. No questions are straight. <laughs> if the house is grounded, is it possible that it could get struck by lightning anyway? <laughs> Yeah, again, that's like kind of beyond my expertise. Anything is possible. <laughs> I mean, lightning can so it's still not strike a the house. So not a sure thing that if the house is grounded, I mean, don't right. have that mindset of, oh, it's not going to right. happen. Right. It, it, can, it can go through various ways the that you have no idea. The electrical service coming to a house is usually grounded. Yeah. So if it does, your house or the electrical surface, 
service, it follows that ground down most of the time. Most of the time is the key. That's the thing. I mean, it's like, I mean, if your window is open slightly, it can come right in the window. Yeah. Yeah. What do you know about ball lightning? Not a lot. Ball lightning can kind of just travel down a hallway. <laughs> you know, um, I've never seen that. Never want to see that. <laughs> I don't know a whole lot about it. I'm not a lightning expert, I just kind of predict the weather. <laughs> what, what do you suggest as a good app to have on our phones that would uh, tell us what's happening? Good question. Good question. Well, okay, so we're the, we're the federal government, right? We're the, the National Weather Service, and this is an interesting story. There's a the federal government and the private weather services. Mm -hmm. And there's a happy medium between the two. In fact, there's a, a book called Fair Weather that talks about what's fair between how much the weather service can give out versus taking away all the profits from the private industry, for example. So we used to, for example, forecast um, for the cranberry bogs and in southeast New England and make a specific forecast like that. But now private weather services can do that. That's within their jurisdiction. We would get fired if we put in a forecast in our forecast discussion something like, uh, here's the forecast for the Boston Marathon or for uh, you know, the opening day of the Red Sox because there's a TV station that provides them with uh, the TV meteorologists in Boston that provides the Red Sox with uh, data. We'll get to the question. Um, but um, so the difference is where public safety is involved, as long as we're asked by an emergency manager, for example, for some specialized support on a given event, so we were at the the, the command center with the FBI and the police and all kinds of things um, for the July 4th Esplanade, right, where there's 500,000 people on the Esplanade um, in case lightning was going to strike um, or any other disasters. Um, so that said, the question was, you know, what's the best app that I can look at on my phone? And so the National Weather Service doesn't have any apps alone. Uh, being the federal government, that's something for the private industry to do. Um, yes. However, um, we, our website is weather.gov slash Boston. If you forget the slash Boston, just weather.gov. Now, weather.com, that's the Weather Channel. That's a great website as well. But weather.gov is your government tax dollars, right? And if you forget the slash Boston, just click on Massachusetts, and it'll bring you to our office. And that's where you get, I mean, I could spend a long time showing you that website, but that's where all the information is. And if you can, you can on your phone, go to that website, weather.gov slash Boston. That's what I would really strongly recommend. Okay, so every cell phone, uh, with the, if it's a newer cell phone, has what's called the wireless emergency alerts. Yeah. Okay, so if there's a tornado warning or a flash flood warning, your phone will go off with an emergency alert. And that's a great thing. It does not go off for severe thunderstorm warnings. It does not go off for severe thunderstorm warnings because there are so many of them across the country I don't want people to be immune to it. So that's a warning. Don't rely on your phone to alert you for a severe thunderstorm warning. Only tornado warnings and flash flood warnings, which are important. They're working on getting the phone system to go off um, automatically for the super severe storms, like three inch diameter hail, mostly in the Midwest and 80 mile an hour winds. So that'll be an improvement. Probably won't happen for a couple of years. But um, yeah, so that's another means of getting it. And remember the weather radio, where you can 
get a weather radio and just turn it on, and if the alarm goes off, it'll wake you up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, that happened, actually, in Concord, Massachusetts a couple of years ago. A, a tornado at 3 o'clock in the morning woke everybody up and got alerted. So anyway, that's it. Yeah, I'll let you go. It's still a long time.